Hello, I'm John David Ebert, and welcome to uh, another class in understanding contemporary art. Uh, in this class, um, and in, in the one or two classes that will follow, we will look at the works of Anselm Kiefer. Now, Anselm Kiefer uh, is the third great artist to come out of Dusseldorf at this period. Uh, he began by wanting to enter into law. He was going to study law, but at the last moment he decided to change and uh, he entered into the Kunst Academy at Dusseldorf uh, right about 1971, just as Gerhard Richter was coming there to teach for 15 years. And that was also during Joseph Boyce's last year there. So uh, Kiefer got in just under the radar, as it were. Uh, and I uh, spent a year or so as the student of Joseph Boyce and learned quite a bit from him. So we can see that there are a number of, we'll, we'll see a number of continuities between Kiefer and Boyce, um, I think he's probably the best exemplar of bearing on the Boycean vision into the next generation of contemporary art. There are a lot of similarities in terms of the, the overarching spiritual vision, some influences coming in from Rudolf Steiner, but uh, I think in Kiefer's case, um, there, there was a much broader range of interests in terms of the esoteric disciplines of things like alchemy and Kabbalah and, and ancient myth. Um, he incorporates and deterritorializes signifiers from all the world's great mythological and esoteric traditions and hybridizes them to produce his own uh, sort of mystery cult. Um, so getting right into the art then, what I wanna look at here is an early watercolor. This is Everyone uh, Stands Under the Dome of His Own Heaven from 1970. Um, this is just a watercolor, but it's interesting because uh, you'll note that the central figure here is doing a kind of Sieg Heil Hitler gesture. And so on the one hand, this is a kind of caricature of, uh, of Hitler and the German Nazi past. And Kiefer started uh, in his first few years being very much concerned with a sort of archeology span of the Nazi past and of Germany's racial past and of the Nordic myths that uh, formed the basis of all of this and gave birth to it. So that every man stands under his own dome of heaven is of course, on the one hand, it's a kind of parody of Hitler and the idea that uh, the totalitarian leader's single private view that he thinks is somehow ingrained on the cosmos is a huge mistake. Um, there's that, but there's there's a double-sided semiotic to this. The other th side of it that interests me actually is how prescient it is about the ontological status of contemporary art in which indeed every artist does indeed stand under his, his or her own dome of heaven insofar as each artist uh, is constructing their own private m uh, microsphere. And it's no longer the case that all the artists are working under the same dome of heaven, that is to say, uh, as in modernism, they're all working, they're, they're not working under the same single overarching macrosphere. Each one is a sort of enigma, uh, the, the priest of his or her own mysteries uh, that have to be solved. And so um, this is another early painting. This is from 1973, Germany's Spiritual Heroes. Kiefer did a series of attic paintings. Uh, he lived, um, he had a studio in an attic at this time. Uh, and he did a series of paintings concerned with the mythology of the, North, of the poetic Eddas, um, and there are a number of mythic references. This one is Germany's spiritual heroes, and he uses perspectival space um, to convey a sense of depth in this attic interior that he's exploring through these paintings. There are a number of altar fires here that are lit. Um, undoubtedly, each altar fire corresponds to one of the spiritual heroes. And in this series of paintings, uh, we have references to Siegfried and, and Parsifal and so forth. So it is very much concerned with a sort of narrow provincialism of uh, the, the German cultural outlook. This though uh, is Cockchafer Fly of 1974, and I think that it begins to announce Kiefer's signature style here, the blasted, burnt out wasteland, the landscape of smoldering ruins. There's a little poem, you can't see it very well, but it's inscribed at the top, that's a reference to a poem about Pomerania, which is the land of Northern uh, Poland, basically, uh, which was once, once a part of Germany. And it's a contested zone, and we see these smoldering ruins uh, that look very much as though the landscape had been bombed. Um, and the other aspect of it, too, is that there, we can already see there's a tendency in Kiefer's work toward three-dimensionality. There's a restlessness evident with the merely two-dimensionality of the surface, and his art becomes concerned more and more with three dimensions over time, with three-dimensional objects, with gluing things onto the canvas. And you can see the sort of raised bumps of the heath here, you almost want to reach out and touch them. They're very tactile. And he very much has a sense that um, he wants to move into, a, to, to transform painting into something that's a little closer to a three-dimensional experience rather than a two-dimensional surface. Um, 1980, this is another, uh, one of his German, his early German provincial paintings. This is Ways, March Sand. 
and about this time we can see him starting to glue things to the canvas now. This is sand. He's taken a photograph of this German landscape, which is um, in the Brandenburg Heath, another contested region. And so it has associations with the Bluten Boden theories of the German tie to the land, the German landscape. He's taken a photograph of this landscape and blown it up to canvas size. And then he's glued actual sand to the canvas. So now he's starting to attach elements to the canvas. Over time, he will attach metals like lead and iron and various kinds of implements and smaller found objects. Um, partially under the influence of the Arte Povera movement that was going on in the 60s in Rome at this time. And there's a strong Arte Povera uh, movement influence on his work. Uh, and as we move forward here, this is Margareta from uh, 1981. And this is a very complex painting. It's an allusion to Paul Salon's poem, Death Fugue, in which Paul Salon wrote a poem in the concentration camp in 1945 that was published in 1952 after he got out of the camps. He was the only one in his family to survive the camps, and he later committed suicide by drowning himself in the Seine. But uh, that poem was written about uh, daily life in the concentration camp, and there are two figures in it, Margareta, which represents the German muse, the German woman. She is Gretchen from Faust, the archetypal blonde muse of German civilization, whose hair is like the straw of the earth. And Kiefer starts gluing straw to his canvases at this time as symbolic of the blonde hair of Margareta, on the one hand, but also the tie to the landscape, to the German landscape on the other. But uh, she has a shadow, and it's the Jewish woman, Shulamit, um, whose hair is described by Salon as ashen, which is an allusion to the fact that it's a, the woman is a brunette. Uh, it's dark hair, but it's also the ash that is a reference to the burning uh, of the Jews in the gas chambers and their sort of transformation. In the poem, Salon talks about them Make digging graves in the sky, essentially, with these ashes that float out of these chimneys in a very ominous manner. And so um, what Kiefer has done here is to represent uh, Margareta with the, these, blonde, uh, these blonde, these yellow stalks coming up out of the ground. And Shulamit is represented with the, the shadows. It, each one of these stalks has a shadow. And basically, I think Solana is saying that Germany made a big mistake, basically shot itself in the foot in trying to disentangle one of its most creative uh, exponents, the, the, the Jewish people who have been there all along, and it was a huge mistake to try and disentangle them. The, the blonde and the brunette form a kind of yin-yang dyad the same way that the Shulamit and Margareta form a kind of yin-yang dialect, uh, a kind of yin-yang dialogue and dialect as well, thesis, antithesis, synthesis a la Hegel. There are these little fires that are lit on the top of each stock which invites a certain comparison with uh, a Hebrew menorah. The menorah is something that has seven uh, branches on it, and it's lit at night. Generally, it's supposed to burn from sundown to sunrise. So we know this is a night scene. There is also a reference in it to the burning bush of Moses, whereby Moses first experiences God through the burning bush. The voice of God comes to him through that burning bush. And we have the sense of the German landscape as being a fruitful one, a fructifying one, but there's the landscape itself looks kind of parched and blasted as though it, these sprouts might be coming up out of a wasteland. And it may be my imagination, I'm not sure, but there's a when I look at this painting, it almost looks like it spells out the word Lilith to me. Um, that may not be an accident. He does have another painting called Lilith. Lilith is an ancient, dark, demonic entity from Mesopotamian civilization uh, that is associated with bringing down civilizations. She plays in the ruins of civilizations. And so if Lilith is indeed spelled out here, there, there's an, she represents a, thir a sort of third entity with Margarita uh, and uh, Shulamit. This uh, is another allusion to another German myth. This is Wallen's Song from 1982, and it alludes to the myth of the master craft craftsman, Wallen, his name is variously spelled and pronounced Wieland or Wayland or Wallen, doesn't matter, it's the same character. He's basically the German re-territorialization of the ancient master craftsman, Daedalus, who we recall had to construct a pair of wings for himself and his son to fly out of the labyrinth. He's the master, the archetype of the master craftsman. Uh, the Wallen myth is a little darker, though, as is characteristic with German myths in general. Um, the king hamstrings Wallen, uh, so that he cannot escape and puts him on an island. So he basically can't walk and he's isolated on an island. But one day the king's sons go to visit him. And as they're rummaging through his things, Fallen creeps up behind them and kills them. Then he uh, cuts off their heads and he takes the skulls, turns them upside down, and he makes these wonderful little bowls out of their skulls. And he makes these gems out of their eyeballs. And he gives these things as presents to the queen and she's horrified. And then he makes a pair of wings for himself and he flies away from the island. 
So um, <clears throat> Kiefer is alluding to the possibility that art here, he has a number of paintings from this time of flying palettes. And so Kiefer is alluding to the possibility of art as a salvific force. He's wondering, will art uh, be the thing that saves Germany, that transforms it? There's a number, there's a bunch of straw that he's glued to the canvas here. The straw is an allusion to possibly the Rumpelstiltskin story in which the Rumpelstiltskin uh, is the creature, the imp who has the talent for spinning straw into gold. And the, the wing itself is made out of lead, which in alchemy, lead is the heaviest basis metal there is, and it's at the counter extreme of gold. Lead eventually will be transformed into gold in alchemy. So there is the suggestion that uh, gold will come out of this somehow. The wasteland will be greened through the processes of art.